There you go. Um, and I think that's it. I'm going to turn it over to Wendy. Do you go ahead? You let me know when you want the PowerPoint. Then we'll. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. Um, so this feels really good to have a crowded room. I can tell everybody's getting their courage back up, and there are fewer and fewer on the screen and more in the room, which is good. Um, people have been asking about these books that we've been doing this summer and whether they're in the library. Uh, first Press has a first rate librarian named Marianne Cottle. And she has been hard at work. I think now six or seven of the books from the summer are already in the library. Um, it, I want to just give you a real quick tutorial about how to use it because it's an incredible resource. You just go to the church website and the little bars up in the corner that you know give you the options as to what you can pull up. You click on that. You'll get the list of things. And down towards the bottom of the list, there's something called resources. You click on resources. And the first thing that comes up is a big headline saying the William Lee Hawkins Library at First Presbyterian Church. And you read down a paragraph or so, and in there, there's a, at least once, if not twice, there's a place where you can click and it will give you the link. And on that link, there'll be a continuous scroll that goes by on the bottom that shows all the new books that have been put in the library in the last several months. But up above that scroll, there's a search line and you can put in whatever book you're interested in, whether it's one of the ones we've talked about or whether it's something else you're looking for, either by the title or by the author. And it will tell you um, if it's in the library. Now, it doesn't tell you whether it's been checked out or not, um, but you know, you just come and see if it's on the shelves. I will caution you, there is a shelf when you walk in, You know, it's this room over here that we've sometimes done Sunday school um, classes in. When you walk in the left-hand door, the desk is on the left. And if you go straight ahead, there's a bookshelf. And at about at eye level on that bookshelf, the, the shelf says new books. So those are the books that have been recently added and eventually will be placed in other places in the library. But those are the last six months so of books. There's also a shelf on that same bookcase for first press authors, which is very interesting during quarantine, I made it my practice to go through and try to read as many of our own authors as I could. Um, so that's that's the basic tutorial on the library and I would encourage you to use it. And like I said, I think we have six or seven of the books. All, my, all five of the books that I'm doing this summer are in there. I think Maren got her book in and somebody else put a book in. Who was the other one? Can't remember who the other one is, but they're there. Okay, let's just open with prayer. Dear Lord, we're grateful today to be back in your presence amongst these friends, your people, our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're grateful for the sort of God that you are, a creating and creative storytelling God who has chosen to create us in your very own image, to put into each of us the desire to create and to tell stories. Our gratitude also is for those who in this forum and in these books share their stories with us that we may be rightly led to discover our place in creation's greater story, that of your love and desire for us to be in relationship with you in your precious and holy name. Okay, so um, I'm doing three books today and we'll pull them up in just a minute, but I'm gonna give a couple um, warnings here or public service announcements before we start. Uh, the guys in the room will probably think this is the Chick Lit Sunday and to a certain degree it is but there is still value uh, for even the men in the room uh, with two of the books in particular. One may be less interesting to the guys. Um, I, I reread these books the last couple weeks and then I spent the last week you know, doing extensive notes about everything I wanted to talk about. And I decided if I went through these notes that I would end up doing what I did three weeks ago and do a whole bunch of talking and not give you a taste of the books. So I'm putting the notes right there and I'm not gonna use them. And I'm just gonna kind of talk off the cuff and share, share with you some things about these books. But the goal is to read multiple passages from each of these books so that you can get a flavor of what they're all about. So I just wanna start off um, by saying, let, let's pull up the first picture of our author. Her mm -hmm. name is Carolyn Weber. And I'll be telling you a bit about her um, in a little bit. Uh, she's Canadian. Um, she spent 20 years in this country and in England, but she's back now in Canada. And she's somebody that I really didn't even know existed until a fluke uh, walk through in a bookstore, I found her. So um, 
When I was a kid, you know how people always ask you who your heroes are. And as an adult, I'm reluctant to say who my heroes are for a variety of reasons. But as a kid, I had three heroes. And my three heroes growing up were um, Marie Curie, you know, the famous scientist who discovered radioactivity, um, Helen Keller, and Queen Elizabeth. And that latter one was sort of fed by my family because my mother's Canadian. And every summer, we, um, my mother and my sister and I, um, would go spend several weeks in Winnipeg, Canada with her parents. The summer that Queen Elizabeth came to Manitoba, which is Winnipeg's province, uh, for the first time as queen, she had been there as princess, but the first time she came as queen was the summer of 1959. And she and Prince Philip made a tour of the Commonwealth and spent a day in uh, Winnipeg. And I remember on that day, my grandmother dressed my sister and I up in little frilly poofy dresses with the crinolines. And we had on our little white anklet socks and our best Sunday shoes and our little white gloves. I wanna say we wore hats, but I don't remember the hats. But anyway, she toted us downtown and we stood in line waiting for the parade, the Royal Parade to go by. And we had a Union Jack in one hand and a Canadian maple leaf in the other. Our chubby little hands were flying those flags back and forth. And it obviously made a great impression on me because for the next several years, I made Queen Elizabeth my pen pal. Um, anytime anything important happened in her life, I would send her a letter, including that first visit. I sent her a letter critiquing the outfit she wore in the parade. And then a few years, a couple of years after that, there was a fire at one of their castles. I don't remember which one it was. It wasn't the big fire at Windsor Castle that happened in 1992, but it was a smaller fire. And I sent her a letter, you know, bemoaning the fact that all her treasures had burnt up. And then um, in 1964, I think, she had her last child, Prince Edward. And I sent her a letter of congratulation about Prince Edward's birth. And those are the three letters I remember, but there was a regular string that I was sending to Buckingham Palace. <laughs> Enough so that when I was in second grade, I got a letter from the queen. Um, it was actually written by her lady-in-waiting, but um, it came to me in the little rural farming community that I lived in in Iowa. And it was such a big deal in that little farming community that I got my own first page picture in the newspaper in an interview about how I was pen pals with Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> so... <laughs> Since then, I've had this probably not too healthy interest in the royal family and all things royal. And at some point, it veered off into the schools that the royals attend. So before I got busy with college and medical school and practice, I was really interested in AIM, um, Ox Oxford and Cambridge, or Oxbridge, as they call them when they mush them together. And um, several years ago, um, you know, it's, I had let that lapse for quite a few years, but several years ago, I was in the bookstore looking at books by Bruce Filer, who is an author that we have done multiple Sunday school classes on, both youth and adult, and also I've presented and read this book. And I noticed that he happened to have a book called Looking for Class, all about his experience in Cambridge that had been written years ago. So I bought that book and I read it. And unfortunately, um, my sheltered lifestyle and my prudish tendencies made that a little bit of a difficult book for me to stomach because there were a whole lot of shenanigans going on in Cambridge back in the day that Bruce reported on. So when I was walking the bookstore aisles again a couple of years ago, lo and behold, I saw this book, Surprised by Oxford. You can pull it up. And I was perfectly happy to pick up a book and be surprised by Oxford because I had been horrified by Cambridge when Bruce told the story. <laughs> so I picked it up and I started reading it and I was hooked. And um, in a lot of ways, Carolyn Weber is kind of a female Bruce Father. How many know the guy I'm talking about? She's the female what? She's the female Bruce Father. Oh. Oh, I think you I think you'd know him if I started toting out some of his books. But in any ways, he is a extremely intelligent, very witty, um, charming, secular Jew from Savannah, uh, Georgia, who writes for The New York Times, has had a whole string of bestsellers, um, including Walking the Bible and a book on Moses and a bunch of other books. And he. Um, <clears throat> 
came from his secular Judaism to a faithful Jewish faith. Carolyn Weber is a very witty, intelligent, um, well-educated, agnostic Canadian who came to um, vibrant Christianity. And the, the, in that way, they remind me of each other. So that's how I got into these books. Um, now, she has written three books. Originally, I was gonna do two on one Sunday and then one on another Sunday. And I was gonna do two together because they kind of overlap each other in time. And then the third is several years later. But we got a good um, candidate to present uh, at the end of the month. Elaine Berberick is going to be doing a book by Father James Martin, who is also one of my favorite authors. Mm -hmm. We did Jesus the Pilgrimage or a pilgrimage several years ago, and she's going to be doing this book on prayer, right, Elaine? So when Elaine was slotted in, I decided to cram all three of these books into one. one. So now I want you to look at that title. It says Surprised by Oxford, a memoir, and it was written in 2011. Um, the second book that she wrote, you can pull it up, Maren, um, is called Holy is the Day, Living in the Gift of the Present, and that was written in 2013, and that's the one that takes place later in her life, but it also is a memoir, a spiritual memoir, I would call it. And then the third book, which just came out a couple years ago, is this one with the provocative title, Sex in the City of God, a Memoir of Love, it, Love and Longing, and that was written, I think, in 2017, and it kind of overlaps with the first book, Surprised by Oxford. Um, so now two of these books, as you'll notice, have memoir in the title. And we talked about this three weeks ago when I did James Smith's book, On the Road with St. Augustine. And we were talking about St. Augustine's uh, most famous work, The Confessions, that he wrote back in 400 AD or somewhere around there. And I mentioned to you that the literati consider that book to be the first autobiography ever written in, time, you know, in history. Um, I preferred to call it a spiritual memoir. And I told you that day that Smith, the author of the book that I was reviewing about St. Augustine, uh, wanted to call it a heterobiography. So that's a term I'd never heard of, but I think it uh, applies absolutely perfectly to these three books. And my definition of a heterobiography from my Christian perspective is an autobiography or a memoir that's written where you see the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit all over that book. Every page you look on, you can see the Holy Spirit at work because that's the author's experience and that's what they're writing about. Uh, Augustine did it in his confessions and Carolyn does it in all three of her books. But I'm gonna to read to you what the definition of heterobiography is uh, from Smith, the author that I presented three weeks ago. So this is what he says. This is why the Confessions, Augustine's book from 400 AD, should never be confused with a memoir or an autobiography. If Augustine shares his story, it's not to disclose something about himself. To the contrary, there's a sense in which his own particularity is diminished, his biography eclipsed. The point is to share a story that is generic enough for any and all to be able to imagine themselves in it. In that sense, his story is not unlike an addict's story in recovery. Smith in his book, I think I told you last time, writes a lot about AA and addiction. And this is one of the allusions he has to AA. Stories that are told at AA meetings are not so you can get to know the storyteller. They're sharing stories in those meetings so that you can get to know yourself. The story discloses something about you. It's meant to help you face up to yourself. What the Confessions, the 400 AD book, asks of the reader is not, what do you think of Augustine, but rather, who do you think you are? Augustine is writing to get readers to respond not to him, but to God. He continues, the story is meant as an invitation to see oneself in a new frame, as a character in a very different story, to see oneself as God alone sees us, as lovable, however deformed we might have let ourselves become. 
The Confessions, far from being an egocentric memoir or an autobiography, are a heterobiography. The author's life told by him, to him, from the point of view of another hetero, from a privileged other God. August, Augustine's story is a story that was given to him by the grace of God, an identity in which he found himself, and he tells his stories for others with the same hope that they might find themselves in the story that God has to tell them about them as his children, his friends, his beloved, as those for whom he is willing to lay down his life. And I think that's a perfect description of all three of these books. Hmm. Okay, so now um, I wanna talk to you about, uh, you know, I like my detours. I really do love my detours. <laughs> uh, during um, quarantine, my sister Sherry and I wrote a book um, in celebration of my father's 90th birthday this past January. And it was a story, uh, kind of a memoir, travel log kind of thing. We took him <laughs> on a big bucket list trip uh, back in late 2019, right before COVID shut everything down and about six months before my mom died. And when we came back from that trip, we decided to uh, write about it and give it to him as a 90th birthday present. And so she'd write a chapter, I'd write a chapter, she'd write a chapter, I'd write a chapter. And she, and then we'd send them to each other to read. And she was forever on my case. She would say, Wendy, just tell the story. Don't go down every rabbit hole known to man. You don't need to be taking all these detours. So I do like my detours and a few of the detours before I start reading it from the book have to do with the titles of these books. Now this woman has a PhD in English literature of the 18th and 19th century. So she is incredibly well read, not only those centuries, but our centuries also, the 20th and the 21st century. And she loves to use literary allusions. And so I'm going to talk about the title of the first book, which is Surprised by Oxford, a memoir. Now, this is an allusion to one of our other favorite authors, C.S. Lewis. Um, you know, he also was an Oxford don or professor, mm -hmm. and the story of his conversion to Christian faith was called Surprised by Joy. And so she titled her book Surprised by Oxford. And this book is just like his book Surprised by Joy. They come from agno agnostic, um, you know, living to the very slow encounter with people who are Christians over a period of years. And eventually they have a rather sudden and dramatic conversion experience from which th they, their life is completely changed. So that's the first illusion. The second illusion is in this, this other book, Sex and the City of God, a memoir of love and longing. Now, uh, for a current cultural touch point in 1997, this woman named Candace Bushnell wrote this book, Sex and the City which was turned into a TV show in 1998 and went on for 10 years or something. And so I'm kind of thinking that Carolyn Weber may have titled this book, Sex in the City, having to do with uh, that um, TV show and that book to get somebody's attention. But she's also an Augustinian, Carolyn Weber is. And the subtitle is a memoir of love and longing which is exactly what Augustine's Confessions was. It was a memoir of love and longing and how he for half his life searched for love in all the wrong places. And when he, only when he was found Christ and Christianity and faith, he was able to order and prioritize his loves appropriately. Mm -hmm. So the memoir of love and longing on the title of this book is an allusion to Augustine. Mm -hmm. The Sex in the City of God is also an allusion to Augustine because his second most favorite book writ written also in the fifth century is called City of God. And in that he talks about um, the realm of um, the redeemed, uh, which is his city of God. It's the realm where God is honored in all things, where he only is trusted for provision and wisdom and where glory is given only to him. And he contrasts that, Augustine does, 
with the city of man, which is the realm of the self, uh, the realm of the fallen, the realm of pride and self-aggrandizement, okay? So she, I think, alludes to both of, of Augustine's books in the title of this one. Now this book, this last book, which was printed in between those two, is called Holy is the Day, Living in the Gift of the Present. And because I love to look for these little secret things in the titles, I have to believe there's some secret hidden in this, in this title, but I haven't figured it out yet. If I ever meet Ms. Weber or Dr. Weber, I will ask her that question. I may just not be well-read enough to know what she's alluding to in this title. If anybody else can figure it out, y'all can let me know. Okay, um, so, uh, and then the next slide is just kind of a, an outline, um, kind of outlines what she deals with in these three books. So these three books are the tale of five colleges. She starts in um, Ontario at the University of Western Ontario. Um, she ends up going to Oxford where she is in two different colleges in Oxford. You know, Oxford is the university and the town but under that, there are 36 or 38 small colleges that are all under the Oxford umbrella. And so she's in two of those. She comes back to the University of Seattle or Seattle University and is a professor there for several years, uh, actually gets tenure there, that's a Jesuit school. And then she ends up at Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California. And some of you know that school because that was where Brent Schlotman was an administrator for quite a few years and he used to talk about uh, Westmont. During the course of these books, she has four children. She has, this is, uh, three of them are born in Seattle. Uh, she has a daughter when she's in her early professorhood get, uh, trying to get ten, a tenure. She has a daughter and then she has a very dramatic pregnancy from which twins boys happen. And just as this last book in her life is ending, she's pregnant with a fourth child and there are anticipated major complications for which an abortion is actually recommended. The book ends before that, but I've subsequently found out that the child's healthy. Um, the book is about three loves. And the first love has to do with her father. And we'll talk about him in a little bit but this continues the theme of absent or deadbeat fathers that I have come upon in so many of the books that I've presented to you over the last several years, most notably Will Willimon. Last year, we read his autobiography or his memoir, Accidental Preacher, and his dad was actually in prison for most of his lives. And this is the guy who was the Dean of Duke Chapel, you know, Willimon for 20 plus years. So that's Carolyn's first love that she has to struggle with a, a, a father who's incredibly troubled and leaves her family very troubled. She then has romantic love that we'll talk about in a little bit. She basically had a boyfriend in high school and college that everybody assumed that she was going to marry. But when she grew in her faith, he did not. And that relationship came to an end. And then God blessed her with the, the husband that she has now. And she had to sort out what that love was all about. And then the third love is the love of her savior. Mm -hmm. And when she found um, Christ and came to Christianity, she was able to put perspectives on these other loves that she had been struggling with and was able to see through the imperfections and uh, in all these people uh, that she had been trying to love that had been struggling to love and finally was able to put on the Christ glasses and see these men in his eyes and that redeemed the love that she had for these three guys. And then the two cities, and that is the city of God that we've just talked about, the Augustine book and the city of man. And it's her struggle to transition from one to the other in her conversion process that she deals with very effectively. She brings along with her, she makes a lot of friends and she brings along with her a lot of friends from that city of man into the city of God. And it's, it's, it's very interesting to see the relationship that she has with all her friends in these books. And then finally, one girl transitioning to a woman and how she envisions her role in this world and her discipleship and her commitment to her savior from the point of her conversion forward. 
further. So now, um, Lauren, this slide's a little messy, but she's going to pull up um, this slide. And the, the deal of this is because these are three books written by the same author that, that are sort of autobiographical, the time overlaps. So down at the bottom, you can see the blue 2011 and the blue Surprised by Oxford. That was the first book she wrote. And if you look up above the big blue stripe and the little tiny blue dots, that is the period in her life that that book covered. If you look down at the very bottom, you see 2020. And I, actually, I guess that book was published in 2020. Sex in the City of God, the most recent book. And you can see, if you look up above the big green stripe and the little green dot, you can see that those two overlap. But they're about two different topics. The one, the surprise by Oxford is about her educational experience, her time in England, her coming to faith. And the green one, Sex in the City of God, is about her um, disintegrating relationship with her old time boyfriend and her growing relationship with her soon to be fiance and husband and the relationship that she had with her husband, with her father. Um, and then the last book, is that 2013, Holy is the Day, and I say last because it occurs later in her life. It was written earlier, but the time frame is later in her life. That is the book that was written um, when she was on sabbatical at Westmont College and then professor at Westmont College, and then when she gives up her academic career, and it goes basically through the death of her father in 2017, which is, was around the time also that she had this very troubled pregnancy. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk you through, I've got half an hour, I'm going to walk you through the timeline of this woman's life, and I'm going to read bits and pieces from each of these three books, and I may or may not tell you what book they're from, but it probably doesn't matter. Um, if you decide to read the books, um, and I would encourage you to read them, there are two ways you can approach it. Um, I would read the Surprised by Oxford book first because that gives you the grand scheme of things. And then I would read Sex and the City second because that's the overlapping book that comes at that time frame from a slightly different uh, perspective. And then third, I would read Holy is the Day, which is her most mature work. You know, in both of these, she's struggling with newfound Christian faith and trying to figure it out. But if you save this one for the last, you can see how she's matured in her faith and what difference it has made in her life and her career and her family. This book by itself is an excellent read alone book, okay? You don't have to have read these first two books to read this one alone. I mean, I think you'll understand it a little bit better if you do, but basically that would be the strategy that I would recommend if you decide you're interested in it. So what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna just walk you through the, her timeline and read you just portions. Um, some will be just a paragraph or two, others will be two or three pages that kind of give you the flavor of her writing. These books are not like the book I presented three weeks ago. You know, I told you that book was a very slow read. It was a valuable read, but it's the kind of thing you wanna read slowly and you wanna read over and you wanna come back to. These books read like novels. I mean, I picked it up and I could hardly put it down. Um, there's also a lot of very poetic stuff in it. She is after all a professor of literature and a lot of what she writes is very poetic, but she also draws on her authors from, you know, Britain, uh, 17th and 18th century and throws that stuff in um, along with contemporary stuff. So first off, uh, I told you she grew up in London, Ontario. She had an older brother and a younger sister. Her parents both came from uh, immigrant families. Her mom's family was Hungarian. Her dad's family was Polish. They were nominally Catholic, but very nominally. I think her grandmother may have been practicing, but her mother, she says, went to church maybe once a year. And basically she had no experience with formal uh, religion whatsoever. We don't know a whole lot about what her dad did. I suspect he was a businessman, but she never really comes out and says it. Uh, they lived a very upper middle class life and had a lot of uh, frills in their life. And then everything kind of fell apart. So I'm going to read you a couple pages now from that portion where the falling apart uh, begins. 
And this is from Surprise by Oxford. Before I started listening to you two, a picture framed my mind. My parents stand poised on the edge of promise, steps spilling beneath them under the arch of my hometown's cathedral. They look like Grace Kelly and Cary Grant, literally. It's a bittersweet thing being the ready daughter of a Helen, the filial beloved of a Lear. The wedding was breathtakingly beautiful as though silvered and inlaid like its frame with mother of pearl. Money grew tight, but it was not always that way. We used to live in a large home in a comfortable neighborhood with luxury cars. We enjoyed a sailboat and a cabin cruiser and a lakefront summer retreat. My father played Santa Claus to the neighborhood children, bought them all gifts, took entire little league teams regularly out to dinner. My earliest memories involve his extreme generosity and indulgent indulgence. I breezily did the sort of things normally denied children, like sitting on my father's lap while driving golf carts or eating lobster dinners in darkened restaurants with fussy waiters. Dolls from all parts of the world decorated my room. As a challenging toddler, I liked to throw things away, such as my father's expensive items, and then pronounce them all gone. <laughs> a fishing rod over the side of our boat or a putter through a sewer slot. My father would just chuckle and buy replacements, another for himself, and usually a smaller version for me. He winced a bit, however, when I flushed his Rolex down the toilet, but still laughed good-heartedly at my mother's admonitions. He was handsome and tanned and smelled wonderful, like some mix of the ocean and fresh-cut grass, except when he smoked his pipe, which also smelled wonderful, as how I thought wisdom must smell when it curls around your head. Winters enveloped us in a fun flurry of sledding, skating, and coming home to hot cocoa. We huddled together watching old movies in quilted succession by the fire. My mother sang all the show tunes. I would bury my face in her apron, resting against the bump of my sister and soaking in her scent of all things comforting and good. Often at night, I would creep into bed next to her just to be encircled by it. Anya Mog in Hungarian, my mother's first language conveys the nuances of a mother's bed. Summers gleamed alive in sunshiny memories filled with splashing in the pool or lake and eating ice cream at the park. Tepid evenings relieved muggy days. Black velvet nights were filled with points of light, either boundless fireflies or on long weekends, fireworks and sparklers. After dinner, my father and I picked still sun warm cherries from the tree in the backyard, popping them into our mouths and spitting out the pits while sprawled together in our lawn chairs. At age six, I took my first piano lesson. I never took a second. A week later, the piano was repossessed. A freak storm hit that winter, complete with thunder and lightning. Our beloved cherry tree sat on a blanket of snow, magnificent, glazed with ice. Like Jane Eyre, one night I awoke to a violent crack. When I looked outside, the ice cherry tree had been smitten almost perfectly in half. It looked back at me, bewildered, broken, smoking from its lightning hit, frost hissing. I never forgot the paragraph, paradox. Shortly afterward, we lost our first house. These were the early days of the great fear to be followed shortly after by the confusion era. My mom became efficient at packing and unpacking. We learned not to answer the door to ignore the strange questions. My little sister cowered and my big brother clenched his fists. Holding hands tightly, we walked home quickly from school, ignoring the cars that followed us or the phone calls late at night that made my mother's hands shake when she came in to check on us and we feigned sleep. Whenever it came time to move again, mother, mom kept us busy. Eating fried chicken and singing songs, I would sit on the counter swinging my legs to her singing as the men walked by with our things. Mom always filled the house with music and poetry and books. Regardless of what poured out, she poured beauty back in. Somehow she managed dance and skating lessons for us and the occasional magical treat of a ballet or an opera. My dad now remained absent, but no one spoke of wares or whys. Of such things, no one spoke at all. I learned that things did not matter, nor did homes. Things came and went, houses changed, stuff was just stuff. It was yours one minute and not yours the next. 
so you can you can tell what's uh, coming down the road. And here another about that. After that first visit of the sheriff to our door, my father disappeared and reappeared, but he never seemed to hold a job for long. And each new scheme came with promises, but no deliveries. For long stretches, my father was nowhere to be seen. Randomly, he would show up with his wallet full of bills and peel them off gallantly as he took us on a shopping spree. Some school clothes here or a new bike there, but it was not often and it was not consistent. And then it trickled off completely. We certainly did not know anything even resembling child support. We moved in with my maternal grandmother. My older brother went to school during the day and delivered pizzas at night, sleeping a few hours on the couch or on a mattress in the basement, never with one complaint. He assumed the mantle of father, standing there helplessly with his thumb, thumb in my parents' leaking dam. After the arrest, my brother could not get the picture of my father's face from the newspaper out of his mind. It loomed up before him as he tried to write his exams. He did not talk to his teachers. He did not say anything. After failing, he was held back a year. My brother made it sound like a lucky break, rationalizing how he would get to play football and hockey for an extra season. Mm -hmm. Once my younger sister entered school, my mom went back to full-time work. She owned secretarial skills, but had been out of the workforce. A proud daughter of immigrant parents, she wanted to pay back the welfare we were forced to take and to make our own way. She dove in and took a typing test. And even though out of practice beat the words per minute average and began a low wage job at the local university. Over the years, she diligently worked her way up, eventually becoming the senior administrative assistant to the provost. I grew up playing in provost offices, waiting for my mom to close up after being given piles of photocopies at the last minute. Education was particularly important to my mother, not only because of the ardent respect unique to an immigrant of the depression area, but also I think because she worked so hard in its antechamber. During my adrenaline years in high school, my grandmother lived and died with us. My brother married, my mom, my sister and I moved into co-op housing. In theory, that meant everyone living there would pitch in around the complex to earn his or her subsidy. In reality, however, it meant a handful of us cleaned and repaired around those who drank and did drugs on their back steps. It was the kind of neighborhood from which police take their time responding to calls. Mom made everything as beautiful as she could, hanging her Rembrandt and Gainsborough prints over the cracks in the walls. She continued to play her classical music, blasting it on the antique record player. Each composer signified a different household chore. We would dust to Rachmaninoff, Heidi to Tchaikovsky, dishes to Liszt, and vacuum to Beethoven. You can always hear Beethoven over the vacuum. Maybe that is one of the advantages to going deaf as a composer. We eventually saved enough to buy a small semi-detached house in a better neighborhood closer to campus. I signed uh, on the mortgage with my mother as a teenager, just before taking my Canadian literature exam. A man is nothing without land. A woman must have a house of her own. So she is very bright does very well in high school, goes to the local university and does extremely well there. And while she's there, um, she starts to accumulate <laughs> Christian mentors. Um, there is this one um, Christian professor uh, that is her literature professor uh, that she meets. And the, the, the portion that I'd flagged to write, write you about that encounter uh, is five pages long, but basically she is a, a brown nosing um, college senior who goes up to him to discuss a poet, uh, John Dunn, on whom she's written a, a paper. And she completely misses the religious allusions in the poem and instead uh, talks to him, her professor, uh, from a feminist viewpoint. I argued that the poem illustrated a classic subversion by the dominant patriarchy, whether it be the church, the priest, the male construction of God or savior, of the threat posed by maternal power or the feminine spiritus. I thought myself quite clever, but I wanted to hear his take before the grade was uh, finalized. Um, the, the professor takes her down in a very gentle way but in his takedown, she gets a glimpse of his faith. Um, 
he says to her, the truth is in the paradox, Miss Drake, anything not done in submission to God, anything not done to the glory of God is doomed to failure, frailty, and futility. This is the unholy trinity we humans fear most. And we should, for we entertain it all the time at the pain and expense of not knowing the real one. Um, he says, the rest is all bullshit, Miss Drake. It's as simple as that. Your purpose here in life is to discern the real thing from the bullshit and then to choose the non-bullshit. Think of the opportunity God has given you to study as the means by which to attain your own personal bullshit detector. Sometimes that will be particularly difficult because those who proclaim to know the truth, well-intentioned or not, are spewing the most bullshit. But you will know when you have been prop properly ravished which is a phrase from the, the poem. And then you'll see, then you'll see how the entire world is eyeball deep in it and that we choose it and that we choose it every day. But the good news is that although we struggle with it, there is a way out. Yes, there is a worthy antidote and option to all the bullshit. And the way that he was talking caused her to consider um, where he was coming from and what, um, that perspective might have in her life. And she molded over for several weeks. And then she went back to his office after she had gotten her Christmas grades. I knocked on Dr. Devereaux's <coughs> door, but there was no answer. I was met by the secretary's dismayed face when I asked when Dr. Devereaux might be in. Haven't you heard, she asked. Dr. Devereaux passed away just after finals week. Mm -hmm. He tallied all the grades and then fell asleep in his chair. His wife found him the next morning poor thing, cold pencil in his hand. The funeral is next week if you'd like to attend. My final memory of Dr. Devereaux was from the last day of our seminar. The class's token joker accidentally spilled his coffee all over Dr. Devereaux's meticulously handwritten notes. A flutter of confusion ensued as the young man, flustered and red-faced for once, apologized profusely while several of us sprang forward with the Kleenex. Sheets of paper, a sock, whatever was at hand, I watched Dr. Devereaux say what was left of his ancient notes without saying a word. We all sat still, too stunned to speak. Suddenly he seemed so much older, so vulnerable. I had not noticed before that his hands shook. And then he looked up at us smiling, said no harm done. I always thought my notes were too dry for their own good. And with a little faith, nothing is irreparable. Now let's see what our dear man Herbert would say about that. Please turn next to the poem, The Caller. So the, God keeps placing these people in her lives. That was the first guy that caught her attention. But she also had this old Christ, this old man neighbor who lived next door to her. Uh, this is Ontario. And she um, writes this right after um, her college graduation um, about her, oh, it's in the other book, excuse me, about, about her neighbor one of these other people that show up on her doorstep, both literally and figuratively. One of our neighbors was an elderly devout man who had taught theology and was busily committed to providing pastoral care to those in need at his church. It was well known in the neighborhood that he had been single his entire life, but eventually got married at an older age to a woman who was his match in years, but not in health. He knew she was dying when they married. Living in such proximity, I saw him almost daily usually when he went outside to sweep his koi pond of leaves. He always smiled at me. Not once did I hear an unkind word from him. Not once, regardless of how pressed he must have been with the intricate care of his wife, did he seem rushed in his conversations with me. He gave me his full attention. He looked me in the eye. He remembered birthdays and noticed when we were sick or had been away, often offering to help get our mail or do yard tasks. Even at the time, such gentle, grandfatherly attentions were not lost on my sister, mother, and me. I asked him once how he could manage to be so kind, attentive, and patient when he, I didn't know how to say it, how do you put into words what I had witnessed, the contorted body of his wife condemned to die a drawn out death? So instead I stammered a paltry query, how are you doing? I mean, how do you seem so peaceful when you have so much going on? He gave me a soft smile, sad and sweet at the same time. You don't live with me, Miss Drake, he said. He often addressed me genteelly by my maiden name. I laughed at what I took for a joke. I wasn't surprised at his humility. He looked me straight in the eye with his usual attentiveness. He wasn't joking, though he seemed joyful somehow. Only one being truly lives with us, he said. You mean your spouse? I assumed with adolescent confidence. 
though inwardly I wondered because I knew his wife was now bedridden and unresponsive. I guess you could say that, he smiled in his gentle way. One beatific, June afternoon, this kindly man called from his porch to catch me as I was leaving in my regalia for my graduation ceremony. His wife had died only a few weeks before and yet he had a graduation gift ready for me. As he passed me the card, he explained that the poem tucked inside had been attributed to Sir Francis Drake, which was her maiden name, the 16th century explorer. He said he thought I might enjoy the words of someone with the same surname from so long ago, especially as I now prepared to set out on my grand adventure across the sea, leaving for my graduate studies in England at the end of the summer. At the time, I thought I would be studying literature, but I ended up learning so much more. I set out to do scholarly work on stories only to discover the greatest story and our very real place within it. But at the brink of such an adventure, I had as of yet no inkling. Here is the Drake poem, which her neighbor gave her. Disturb us, Lord, when we too pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true, because we dream too little, when we arrived safely, because we sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life, having fallen in love with life. We have ceased to dream of eternity, and in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wilder seas, where storms will show your mastery, where losing sight of land, we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and to push back the future in strength, courage, hope, and love. This we ask in the name of our captain, who is Jesus Christ. We stood there in the sunshine and bird song, our hands joined by the passing of a piece of paper. So much has changed, always changed, changed always by a single missive. It would be much later when I actually read the poem, I mean, really read it, at the time, I simply took the card and tucked the gift under my arm and thanked him. Then I asked him hesitantly how he was feeling since the funeral. Sad, I miss her terribly, but relieved too, if I'm honest, Carolyn, she trusted her savior and I need to trust too. When I think of our mutual hope and the promise of heaven, I'm joyful. He teared up but smiled. A bit uncertain, I shifted my weight uncomfortably. Silence settled between us. My neighbor seemed at peace with the peace, but not me. No, never could I imagine at that time being at peace with such a peace. Um, she blurts out, she talks about another book that he references, but then she blurts out, I don't know how you did it. I mean, how could you marry her knowing what was coming and then watching her suffer, being there for her every need? how you went through it all, and then loving a God who would allow it, he said nothing. I mean, I insisted again with all the honesty but obtuseness for propriety of my age, how you took care of her and must have felt so helpless. And then while losing someone you love like that slowly and painfully right before your very eyes, how did you manage? How can you? I trailed off preventing myself from asking how he could believe in this God he celebrated with the lighting of candles in his window every Sabbath. How could he, in a house full of impending death, darkened now in mourning, still practice this belief? How could he study and minister in death and still believe? I kept grasping through my own tangled disbelief, feeling myself contorting painfully in the process until I finally blurted out, what did you do at the very end? He gave me a clear look of compassion tinged with sadness. Then he leaned in and kissed me gently on the cheek. I fell silent despite feeling the rising up yet again of that knee-jerk reaction towards unfairness, though at whom I could not name. It was the persistent assumption of a whom that struck me even then, however, and some strange understanding of the unspeakability of such a name. Something in me did not want to stay the same either, but how to change, could I change? The kiss hummed on my cheek. So she gets this incredible scholarship to go to Oxford to study <coughs> as long as she wants. She ends up getting a master's and a doctorate degree in literature while she's there. She's in one college for one year and then she switches to the, a second college for three more years when she does her doctorate. And while there, she comes under the influence of this group of, of friends, several of whom are Christian, several of whom are not. 
And the Holy Spirit keeps prodding her in all these experiences. And finally, she gets to the point where she realizes that she has progressed in her budding faith way beyond the boyfriend um, that, that she left at home and that she is going to um, uh, need to, to break up with, with her uh, boyfriend. Um, <clears throat> she goes home at Christmas that year and breaks, um, um, breaks up uh, with her boyfriend um, <clears throat> and tries to adjust to her old life with her new, uh, new sensibilities. Um, and a lot of it has to do um, with her, um, um, her father complex um, because um, you know, she's never dealt with this absent father. Um, she comes back to, to Oxford and actually has um, a conversion experience on Valentine's Day that she's been prepared for that entire semester and the, and the next semester because she's been hanging around with these Christians She's found herself wandering into churches. She's picked up the Bible and she's uh, started reading. And I'm um, just gonna read you a little bit about that. And you know, the Baptist in me likes this. Back, oh, this was also, um, this, this was Valentine's Day back in Oxford, her first year. Back in my room, I sat cross-legged in the dark against my bed mesmerized by the flickering of a single candle lit on my mantle. I watched it turning blue, turning red, turning orange, and even a thread of green, but no pink to my relief. I opened my Bible to the beginning of the Gospel of John. I did not feel much like reading the Bible, but if I'm going to be accused of being holier than thou, as one of her friends had just done, I might as well make the most of it, I thought cynically. I began reading, and the more I read, the more I wanted to read. Once the Bible gets under your skin in its powerfully charismatic way, if you pardon the pun, then we all have favorite passages or perhaps a certain specific pass passage that particularly spoke to us at a significant moment. For me as a lover of literature and that particular night, it was the opening chapter of John. As I sat there in my tiny room with the slanted floor, the words started blurring on the page and before I knew it, tears escaped my eyes. I tried blinking them away, but they kept coming. I blinked again hard. The words on the page came into sharp focus, then everything all of a sudden became very, very clear. I knew that Jesus was who he said he was, plain and simple, true and everlasting. I knew that I wanted to know him, to know him first, and to know him better. I knew that I had been an idiot, proud and imperfect, despite all my best efforts. I'd been hard on myself and hard on others. Who would have guessed that when you really look at it, perfectionism, like anything else, can be a sin? Everywhere I turned in the labyrinth, I was met by an impenetrable wall. The only way out was to be lifted up or a ladder out of my want. There existed no act, no achievement, nothing I could do. The only freedom was in faith. And then I knew I did not what I did not want. I did not want to return home, wherever that may be, again and again in my life to no one and finally to nothing of importance. I did not want my life to be empty, a regurgitation of excess, no matter how fluorescent or desperate ex existentialist filling of a bucket with a hole in it in the bottom. I did not want to live according to the meaningless exchange of bodily fluids, sweating among strangers, maneuvering amid pseudo-intimate relationships. Christ offered a bridge over the gap, I felt, sitting there on the floor between myself and my soul, between my God and me. I wanted to know God and to be known by him, a relationship so intimate that there was no space between him and my soul. But it was not as if I could shut my eyes tight and concentrate, just make it happen as I had done with virtually everything else in my life from the positives like getting good grades to the negatives like denial. The leap seemed so impossible, so hard, so far. And then a story from the gospel of Mark jumped into my head. Scripture has a way of working like that, be forewarned. It was a man moved to faith by his love for his child. He brought his son who had been tortured and then rendered senseless by a demon to Jesus to be healed after his disciples could not do it. The father asked Jesus, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Jesus should have been insulted. If you can, he repeats, but instead of walking away, he continued. Everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. After Jesus healed the boy, his disciples asked him privately why they had failed. Jesus replied, this kind can come out 
only by prayer. That man's desperate plea for the overcoming of his unbelief echoed deep within me, leaving nowhere to hide. God had called out even this very last facade, this trump card of an excuse, this very final resting place of despair. And it appeared that for us, particularly hard nuts to crack, the only answer is prayer. I wanted the real thing. Lord, help me overcome my unbelief, a simple prayer, so brazen after the complete disregard for the presence and power of the Almighty in life and in death. Not even a prayer from belief, but a prayer to overcome disbelief, the lowliest of requests, but at least from me, the real thing. And then just like that, I was on the other side, the other end of the chasm, through me, over me, beyond me, safe and safe. And I'm really running out of time. So <laughs> she um, spends her three years in Oxford, develops this relationship with this young man who's the son of an American pastor who comes back to the States after the first year. They have a long distance relationship for three years. They eventually get married. Um, he is the one who first articulated the Christian faith for her at Oxford. And out of that friendship becomes this romantic um, relationship. She comes to Seattle University and works hard for seven years to get tenure, the whole while being told by all her colleagues, do not write on your personal faith issues. It will destroy your academic career. She ends up having a daughter and then twins and nearly dies during the death of the twins. And that chapter is just gut-wrenching. Um, and then she goes on a sabbatical to Westmont College where she um, is there for a year, but with three little babies and a busy teaching career and trying to write these books, she has an episode of burnout and comes pretty close to committing suicide. Um, friends walk her through that. Um, while in Westmont, she and her husband decide that they don't wanna be academicians any longer. And through the guiding of friends and the Holy Spirit, they decide to move back to Canada where they live on a farm with their four kids, the fourth child being born in Canada right after she leaves Westmont. And um, she reconciles with her father and there's an incredible chapter about um, the death of the father where she sits by his bedside um, in the um, hospital. And these images she has of her birthday parties, these pictures she has of her birthday parties from when she was six and seven, when he's nowhere to be seen, Lo and behold, it turns out that he's carrying the picture with him, and she eventually um, leads him to faith uh, before his death. Um, and then, you know, it ends, um, this, this last book ends as she's told about her fourth pregnancy um, and is told that the baby is going to be severely genetically um, damaged and that she needs to have an abortion and decides not to. Um, um, and carries through with the pregnancy, but the book is written before the end of the pregnancy. I mean, I had so many things I could have read to you. I mean, I just literally, I could have read for three hours passages from these books and I can't recommend them highly enough. And like I said, they're easy reading and more than that, they're reading that will fill your soul when you read them. So any quick questions before we call it quits? Okay. Well, yeah. Floyd, are you next week? No. So, so next week is um, Ken Wilkins, and he's not here to give us a, a preview, but it's a novel that he's very excited about. So um, next week is Ken. And I think that's it. We'll see you for if you're coming to 11 o'clock. We'll see you real soon. Are you